this picture that we have right here is a picture of the composer, D.E.R., he also goes by, um, and he is a Haitian-American composer. Um, so this piece, Dancers, Dreamers, and Presidents, um, it was composed in 2010, and it was, um, it, it's, it's a three movements, Dancers is one movement, Dreamers is one, and Presidents is one, and they all kind of move into each other in a seamless fashion. It's about a 20 minute piece, um, and it melds together at times with rock elements and hip hop elements, um, which is kind of cool. And um, it was, you can read the program note, but I'll, I'll share a little bit of information with you. Um, the primary inspiration came when the composer was watching Ellen DeGeneres, the TV show, and um, Senator Barack Obama, before he was president, came onto the show. And any of you that may have seen, see, watched Ellen, you know that sometimes she invites her guests to kind of dance <laughs> on stage. And so it was a, a kind of unique moment where um, Senator Obama at the time was dancing on TV with Ellen DeGeneres. And the composer was struck by the um, meaning of this moment, this future president, um, and all of the um, social things that he represented, you know, the first African-American president dancing on TV with Ellen DeGeneres, you know, and having this combination of pop culture and politics, so to speak, um, was interesting to him. And so he created this piece with the idea that the musicians on stage are dancing with each other, in perhaps in the same way that Obama and Ellen were, or just, you know, anyone who's a dancer and a dreamer, um, they dance. <laughs> so that was the inspiration for the piece. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's different probably from what you're, you may be used to hearing um, in this concert hall, but it's a great piece full of energy. And um, it was commissioned by the same King Commissioning Consortium. And this is kind of an interesting fact that currently works by Black and Latino composers account for less than 1% of the classical music performed by American orchestras each year. So the Space Commissioning Consortium, it's their, they feel it's their job and their task to try to change that. And so each year they commission a composer, a Black or Latino composer, um, to write a work and um, work with partnering with other orchestras to have that work performed. So this piece was part of that Space Commissioning Consortium, and we were one of the partnering orchestras mm -hmm. on that commission. So that's where this piece kind of came from and why it's on our program tonight. So I think you guys are, are going to enjoy it. Um, it's going to rock the house, so to speak. Um, <laughs> and then we have the Mozart Piano Concerto. And um, my husband is a big Mozart fan, and he was kind of a little bit disturbed that I'm kind of rushing over Mozart in this pre concert talk <laughs> because there's so much to say about Copeland. And of course, we could spend probably a whole talk talking about Mozart, but um, it's just a beautiful gem of a piece, this piano concerto. Probably um, one of his more popular, more, most performed piano concertos, one of only two that's in a minor key, um, but it ends in a triumphant major at the end. Um, and our soloist is Angela Hewitt, and she is just a remarkable, uh, very refined, very delicate, beautiful player and a fine interpreter of Mozart. Um, and you may, of course, recognize the second movement of this concerto. Um, any of you that have seen Amadeus, <laughs> um, you'll recognize the from Amadeus at the very end of the movie. So it's a very famous movement that I'm sure that you will recognize and love. So, um, so let's start the first half. Now we come to Copeland. Um, Copeland Symphony Number no. Three that we are performing on the second half of our concert. Um, Copeland, I think, is is um, you know one of the most important American composers. You know, if not the most important American composer. Um, and I think it's it's nice that his dates are 1900 to 1990 because it makes it easy for us when something was. Uh, composed in 1946, we know that he was 46 years old. Um, when we know in 1920 that he studied in Paris, 1921, we know he was 21 years old. So the math is a little easy to figure out, which I think is always helpful. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Copeland's early life. Um, he started out, he was born um, in Brooklyn, Jewish descent, and he was the youngest of five children. He started taking 
music lessons at a young age. His mother encouraged him to take piano lessons. Um, and he very quickly started composing. And by the time he was 15 years old, he knew that he wanted to be a composer. And I think this story is important because it shows that he didn't come from a musical background. He didn't come from a musical family. He was just a kid that was born in New York, you know, and started taking music lessons and decided to be a composer and ended up being one of the most influential American composers of all time. You know, so it's profound, I think, to show that anyone from any background or any group, if they have the passion and the commitment and the discipline, can become the next Aaron Rodgers, perhaps, you know. Um, and of course, while he was in New York, he regularly attended the Met, the New York Symphony at the time. It, this is before it was called the New York Philharmonic when he was a kid. Um, and he gave his first public performance to pianists at the age of 17. Of course, he had all the wonderful resources of New York, which, of course, gave him the opportunity to study music and composition with wonderful artists and kind of set him on a good path. Um, in 1921, a very pivotal thing happened for Copeland. He went to France. And he studied at the Summer Academy the, um, in Fontainebleau, the American Conservatory Summer School. And it was there that he worked with Nadia Boulanger. Now, those of you that have come to our free concert talks, you may have, of course, remember the name Nadia Boulanger. It comes up quite often. Many people studied with her and were quite influenced by her. And most recently, when Skorbachevsky was here as a conductor, he had studied with Nadia Boulanger. So this is a little bit of a connection there. Um, but what I think is profound is here, Copeland goes to France and he studies with Boulanger, and at the time she's only in her early 30s. So she's herself very, very young and already an influential teacher making a profound impact on the life of a very young composer at the time. Um, there's a picture of Nadia Boulanger, and uh, this wonderful woman. And Copeland was um, always very strongly adamant about saying that his working with Boulanger was the most pivotal moment of his life, you know, the most influential moment. And it set him on this path and on this trajectory. So he really uh, dedicated a lot to her and owed a lot to her. And she, in turn, um, would often name Copeland as her first student. You know, when she would give her list of students, she would say Copeland's name first. You know, I think she felt a great deal of pride um, in her working with him. And it was in 1925 that um, Copeland had his first major of an orchestral work, and it was the symphony for organ and orchestra, and it was performed by Nadia Boulanger. Um, and this came to be um, kind of by the urging of Kusevitsky, and um, Copeland met Kusevitsky in France at this young age. And I'm just, you know, again, astonished to think, here's a 25-year-old composer having a work performed by um, what was to be the New York Philharmonic and the Boston Symphony Orchestra. You know, I mean, and I think um, that shows you the talent that he had from a very young age, that someone like Kusevitsky and Boulanger believed in him so profoundly to give him this opportunity that put him immediately on the national stage where people knew about him and knew um, this is somebody to watch, you know, because he was only a kid, he was only 25 years old at this point. Um, so this is really the beginning of a very important relationship that he begins with Kusevitsky. Um, I'll just give you some other kind of timeline of some relevant things um, that relate to the symphony number three. So in 1940, um, Copeland's invited by Kusevitsky to teach at Tanglewood. Um, and I, I'm from Massachusetts, and I, I um, have been to Tanglewood countless times. And to be walking on the grounds at Tanglewood um, in the Berkshires, you feel the spirit of Copeland when you're there. You really do. Um, and, and Copeland really, really loved um, spending time at Tanglewood teaching and, and making an impact on what was going on there. And this, again, was a continuation of this relationship with Kusevitsky. They had a very, very strong relationship. In 1942, Copeland completes his portrait, Fanfare for the Common Man, which is relevant to the piece that we're going to hear tonight, um, and Rodeo as well. And in 1946 is when he completes his symphony number three. This is the middle of a kind of populist period for Copeland, right after composing Appalachian Spring, you know, all these pieces that are great pieces of Americana, you know, that, that were very, very successful and popular at the time. Um, he gives his conducting debut in 1958, which I wanted to just throw in there to kind of show that he also was a conductor later on in his life. Um, and then he dies in 1990, and his ashes are scattered at Tanglewood. So that's perhaps why his spirit, you can feel it when you're there. Um, so, musical style. You know, Copeland wanted
wanted to be American. You know, I mean, he was American, but he wanted his music to sound American. He wanted to create an American sound. He wanted, when you heard his music, for you to say, this is the music of America. You know, in the same way that you think the North Korean Russian, you know, this same kind of national pride. And some of the ways that he did that, he really wanted to develop this American musical idiom. Some of the ways he did that, he would use American stories, like Billy the Kid or um, Romero, all of these things are American stories. He would connect with, um, he would use American styles, such as jazz, and he worked also with American folk tunes. Not unlike Ives, of course, Ives would often use folk tunes and put them into his music as well. So these were some of the ways in which America, a Polish, tried to make his music American. Um, and this, I think, is a wonderful, also, example of that. When someone asked Copeland, what makes your music sound American? This is in his own words, some of the things that he said. He said, the optimistic tone. You know, there certainly is a feeling um, in America of, you can be anything, you know, you can do anything. And I think he tried to capture that optimism in his music. His love of rather large canvases. You can almost feel when you're listening to Copeland that you're looking out over the westward, you know, out westward and you're seeing these big beautiful plains, this big expanse of country that is yet to be conquered or discovered, perhaps, you know? And a certain directness in expression of sentiment. I think that's nice too. And a certain songfulness. You know, there's a certain kind of melody that exists in Copeland that is that is uh, songful as he puts it. So these are some of the ways in which Copeland said that his music sounded American. Um, let's look at the Copeland symphonies in general. So technically, even though this is his last symphony, his symphony number three, technically there's five symphonies because of the dance symphony he didn't number and the organ symphony he revised. So um, even though Symphony Number no. Three is his final sim symphony, his final symphony, um, there in fact were actually five uh, symphonies that he wrote. So at this time, 1944, 1946, is when Copeland is working on his Symphony Number no. Three. Um, there's a lot of other significant American thirds that are coming onto the public um, sphere, so to speak. And at this time, all of these of these thirds were commissioned and introduced by Copeland within seven years. So we had Roy Harris, who was another um, very um, you know successful American composer in 1939, who writes his third symphony. We have William Schumann in 1941 writing his third symphony, and then Aaron Copeland in 1946. So when Copeland comes to write his third symphony, he's coming in in a time period where there's already been a little bit of a um, a path blazed for him, and so he knows that the expectation is high. You know, there's people are waiting to hear Copeland's third. And the one um, unifying thing between all three of these pieces in particular is that they all were American, but they did not use folk songs. They did not use um, an American story, perhaps. They were all completely original musical material, musical ideas. Um, but yet it captured this American. So it's it's really a profound um, thing. It's unlike Ives in this in this regard. Um, Kusevitsky, as I said, commissioned these works, and Kusevitsky uh, commissioned Copeland's Symphony Number no. Three that we're going to hear tonight. Now, Kusevitsky was the music director of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, um, and his tenure with the Boston Symphony was 1924 to 1949, so 25 years. Kusevitsky was another one of those, like Boulanger, a really important figure in music history. He was the guy that, it's because of Kusevitsky we have Lord Hawk and Charitable Orchestra, you know? It's because of Kusevitsky that we have the Ravel orchestration of Mussorgsky's Picture Academy Exhibition. So this was an important guy. <laughs> um, and he was commissioning all kinds of pieces. And he did a tremendous service to American music. As I mentioned earlier, he created the Copeland Program at Englewood. And he first met Copeland in Paris when Copeland was in his 20s. During his tenure, he performed 12 Copeland works with the Boston Symphony. So he was a big supporter of Copeland. And Copeland really served as an advisor for Kusevitsky on um, American music. 
And so the third symphony is really a culmination of their relationship, you know. And I'm kind of telling you all this so that you realize what this third symphony meant for Copeland. You know, this was not just some work that he was writing. This was a work that was commissioned by a very dear friend of his at a time in music history where people were waiting to hear what it was going to be. You know, what it was going to be about. Um, there's just a picture of his work piece for you, so you can see it. Um, so, symphony number three. It's um, Copeland's final symphony that he writes. Um, it premiered in 1946 with the Boston Symphony. This symphony he conducted. Um, it is the most popular American symphony. So the most recorded, the most performed, and the most, the best known of all. So this is a profound statement, you know. This is the most, um, people often call it the essential American symphony, this piece, you know. And um, it was composed at the end of World War II, and it was a time of, of idealism, national unity. He was trying to bring the country together in this work. It, this was all kind of put in this wonderful piece of music. Um, and it connects um, the American sound to the symphonic form. And what I mean by that is that the symphonic form is really a European model. You know, the idea of a symphony in four movements, this is a European model. And so Copeland takes American, um, the American sound, the American spirit, and all these things we talked about, this um, optimistic tone, this kind of tuneful quality, and puts them into a European model, creating an American symphony. Um, he incorporates the fanfare for the common man, which you will hear in the last movement of the piece, um, and it's his largely purely instrumental score that he ever wrote. It's about 42 minutes long in all, the piece, so it's a significant piece um, for Copeland and his output. And as I mentioned earlier, he knew that something substantial was expected of him, so he really knew this is it, <laughs> you know. Um, just to talk a little bit about the fanfare for the common man, um, you guys all know the fanfare for the common man. Many of you do. If you if you think you don't, I'm sure you do when you hear it. <laughs> um, it was one of a series of ten fanfares commissioned by the Cincinnati Symphony um, in 1922. And the the important thing about this piece is that Copeland decided when he was writing for Symphony Number no. Three, I'm going to use the fanfare for the common man in this work. And it then became the theme from which all other themes, in a way, were generated. All of the other themes in this entire symphony, you can find some way to relate them to that fanfare for the common man theme. And you don't necessarily realize it as a listener until you get to that last movement and you hear the fanfare come in, and it all makes sense. You know, it's remarkable. And so um, this, this fanfare starts with the rising fourth and the rising fifth, and this is really the main gesture in the entire symphony, this, these little intervals that you hear. Um, the fanfare is the whole thing. Like, and the um, so you'll recognize it when you hear it. Um, the mood of our symphony. So this was a time that it was the closing days and the end of the largest war known to human history. This, this was a time that they needed this music of affirmation, positive music, you know, to bring the country together. And when Copeland began the symphony, D-Day had already occurred, but the final two movements uh, were composed after the war had ended. Okay. <laughs> um, and Copeland himself said that he really wanted the piece to capture this spirit of the country at the time. So this was his goal. He really wanted it to embody this feeling of patriotism, this feeling of euphoria, you know, that, that was, was felt in the country at this time. So this was what he was really doing with this work. Now the reaction was generally very strong. Listen to this, he thought it was great. <laughs> he loved it. Um, but some people were kind of critical of the piece because it's very grand at the end in particular. It's very um, powerful. The brass players are having fun, <laughs> you know? They're playing with big, full, beautiful sound. And Copeland, I love this quote that Copeland said. He himself claimed that he had deliberately adopted a broad, familiar symphony style, not trying to explore new, unnatural 
individual being grand. And I love that quote. I just think it's funny, you know, this idea that he he really he knew and he went for it. <laughs> you know? So it's this broad, grand finale. It's just remarkable. Um, these are some recordings that are um, some good recordings. I've listened to the Copeland and the Bernstein and the Mottled recordings. Um, and they're all very different. The New York Philharmonic one, the Bernstein, is probably the most famous recording, I would say. The Copeland recording was very famous, too. But the Mata one with Dallas is really, really good. It's a good recording. I haven't listened to the other ones, actually. But this is just to tell you that there's a lot of recordings in this piece. And they're all a little different. And it's great. If you, I mean, this is one of those pieces where there's so much in it. There's so much in it. And you really can listen to every recording and get something from it. Um, the Copeland one is really fun to listen to and hear what he did with the piece. Some of his tempi are a little bit slower, actually, than you would expect, which is kind of interesting. Um, but this is just to give you a sense of that. Um, let's do a little bit of an overview of each of the movements um, in the work, and, um, and we'll go from there. So our first movement, um, the main thing to think about in the first movement is that it's kind of like an arch. So it starts out very, very soft, just with the first violin, some of the, the wind playing, at a very slow tempo. And little by little, the orchestra joins in, and it gets faster and faster and faster. And our tempo speeds up, and it culminates kind of in this. It tapers and comes back again. So it's an interesting form, because it starts in this slow fashion, gets faster and faster and faster, and then comes back to the slow beginning that we started with. Um, and it, it makes it tricky as a conductor, too, because uh, the acceleration <laughs> in an organic fashion. Um, so that is the goal there. And you hear um, different these different themes coming in this first movement. It's very broad. It's a beautiful, beautiful first movement. We come to our second movement, and it's your typical scherzo um, form. So you have this um, great chord theme at the beginning, and it just takes off from there. And then you have this beautiful lyrical middle section, the trio um, in the scherzo movement, that starts with a beautiful theme in the oboe. Um, and then little by little, the return comes back with the, the horn themes at the beginning. So it's just kind of like your standard scherzo um, that you hear in this movement. Our third movement begins um, with very, very soft, beautiful strings at the top. The first violin and the second violin enter. And in this movement, as I put up here, it's the freest of all ensemble structure. Each section just kind of comes out of the next. You know, it's one of those movements where you just find yourself in the next section, and then you find yourself in the next section, and it's beautiful. And it just kind of unfolds in a very natural way. And then there's this magical moment at the end of this movement. Um, there's this really kind of sparkling colors and harmonics in the strings, and something is happening. And you kind of know as a listener, something's, something's going to go on here. And the winds give a little theme, and we have this low chord um, in the strings that comes to an A flat major chord. And then before you know it, we come to the last movement. And we hear the fanfare theme in the flute. It's like a, from nowhere, out of the distance, beautiful. Oh, it's gorgeous. And um, so here's our <laughs> fourth movement. And you have this seamless connection into the fourth movement. Um, and you know you're there when you hear this fanfare theme coming from the flutes. And before you know it, the brass kicks in and they give the pretty much the, the full fanfare for the common man as you're used to hearing it um, when it stands on its own. And then again, the symphony takes off into a little um, some kind of variation, the theme and variations on the fanfare theme. And you just kind of don't know where it's going to go next. It's remarkable. And at the end of the work, um, the theme from the first movement comes back. And so we have this kind of Christmas thing where, um, where we're brought home, so to speak, where all the themes come together and you see the relationship between all the themes in this work. So it, it's just it's, it's remarkable. It's, it's, it's a wonderful piece. Um, and I, I think it's a special work for this orchestra to perform as well, because this orchestra, you know, it's kind of become part of our identity to perform American music, you know. And um, so to be able to perform what is thought by many as, as I said earlier, the most essential American symphony of all, by probably the most essential American composer, it's, it's an incredible 
incredible work and seeing the time in which it could be composed, the time in which it came into Oprah's life, and all that he accomplishes in this work, um, it's remarkable. It's, it's, it's one of those pieces that I think is a very, very special piece in the world of love. It's a very special piece. Um, so we are about out of time, and um, I think I'm going to leave it at that rather than take the end question so that I can break off <laughs> and get ready for the concert. Um, but I want to thank you all for being a great audience tonight, and um, I hope that you enjoy the, the concert. I know that you will, so um, I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you.